us, I, I want our team to put up the information regarding the number three. Now, I want to warn you before we get into this, this is not numerology. This is three based upon biblical revelation and truth. We don't worship numbers, but we use them to decode eternal life. There was an article written uh, in the Kansas City Star about eight years ago that really intrigued me. Uh, it pulled together the research of multiple pastors and leaders uh, who were deep in theology and seminary and research, and they discovered that the number three biblically represents and symbolizes so many different things. Divine wholeness, fullness, resurrection, completion, and perfection. So tonight what I've done, I have selected three readers, if you all will come and stand now, the first two, to begin to read the text so that we might extrapolate some truth. This is Bible study. Oh, is it okay to teach? Now, we're probably going to shout in a minute. Y'all know I, I, I can't promise you that I won't run and jump. You know me. But we want to dig in to give you some morsels of truth for the rest of your life. I have, I'm getting ready to drop something on you that I probably have never shared ever in my life before in terms of a preaching audience or stage, but it is a secret weapon that God has given me. We do know that the Bible um, began from Dead Sea Scrolls. There was a matriculation later on to the Gutenberg Press. This is 1300s, 1400s. They would have monks who were holy, fasting, and praying who would write the text according to context. Now, the Bible initially was not broken down into books or chapters or verses, but later they prayed and then they made it make sense and they put it into verses. Does that make sense? So therefore, when you're reading, that's where verses came from to make it palatable to the reader according to sections and to dissect truth. I believe that every three scriptures, you actually see a divine wholeness, fullness, resurrection, completeness, or perfection according to the verse in multiples of three. This means three, six, nine, twelve. Are you guys with me so far? 15, 18, 21. What I'm trying to tell you is that if you immerse yourself into God's word, you will be able to extrapolate truth and revelation that fits your situation in these verses. I don't have time to talk about the number one, which means light, because light is unity. On day number one, he said, let there be light, 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 light. And there was light, because light represents unity, and the first day represents a unified God who, before he blew the breath of life into man, had to first shine light on the earth. I don't have time to talk about the number two, which represents agreement. If any, oh, y'all so smart. If any two or three, wait a minute, any two agree. So if you got two people in your house and y'all could just agree, Lord have mercy. Wait a minute, I'm not going to leave the single people out because if your heart and your tongue would just agree, if your mind and your feet would agree, uh, y'all not work. Uh, if your pocketbook, uh, that's an old school term, if your wallet, if your cash app, if your Apple Pay and your hand would just agree, if any two or three, so this number three is then added. Genesis chapter number one, we're going to read verses. There are 32 verses in Genesis chapter number one. I'm brainy. Let's work it out. It's going to be okay. I will confess, I'm going to give you a lot of text tonight. If you're not here to learn, you might want to exit now. Where we're going, no one else can go. You are selected to be in this room because God has chosen you for this time and this season. You logged on because God wants to drop something that's going to rock your world and turn your world up side down. Are you ready? Genesis chapter number one. Let's read multiples of three. That's going to be three. Okay. So I want you to go to verse three, three. Got you. six, nine. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. 
Verse 6 says, and Hold on a second. So verse number 3, read it once again. And God said, let there be light. So in this light, there is divine wholeness, fullness, resurrection, completion, and perfection. Verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So wait a minute, a firmament in the midst of the waters. This is where God is about to create clouds. So in other words, what he does is resurrect water by separating clouds. There is also a resurrection of clouds. In other words, God pulls out of what's in his mouth. Yes, sir. Are, is it making sense? Yeah. Represent, represent divine wholeness, fullness, resurrection, completion, and perfection. Verse 9. We're going to roll through these real quick. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So God pulls all the water together into one place, creating seas and oceans. And then he says, come here, dry land, be resurrected from the water. The land was there all the time. Yeah. yeah. So multiple of three. Verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the true yielding fruit, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is gonna make me run right here because everything God wants to do in you is in you. Yes, sir. Everything he wants to go through you is in you. So the resurrection is all he does is pull your gifts and talents and say, come forth. Do you see the resurrection? Yeah. See within itself, come here, see, now you produce fruit. Next multiple of three, 15. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. So the lights were already in the heaven, now I need you to shine forth. Come here, be resurrected, create divine fullness. Please keep reading, verse 18. And to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God said, saw that it was good. So God creates the sun and the moon to rule over the day and the night. In other words, there is this divine wholeness and fullness whenever you have light. You got light in the day, but you don't think that you have light when it's dark, but you actually have light because it is the moon's reflection and illumination from the light that created it. Yeah. 21. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. When it says God brought forth, brought forth, there is a resurrection of what was in the water. Come here, be resurrected. Come here, whales, and display yourself. Everything that you're going to create is in you or in your hand or in your head. Let me get the next multiple of three, 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. So then now we break it down to animals. That that was in the animal, come here, bring forth. Come here, be resurrected. Everything in the animal, bring it out, resurrected. Is that making sense? And you thought you were the only ones who could get pregnant, but the animals started first. <laughs> 30? 27. Oh, 27. Thank you. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Oh, God. Male and female created he them. Is this not a representation of divine wholeness and the fullness when God creates you in his own image? Oh, God. God says, I'm not complete. Remember the definition, one of the definitions of the biblical meaning of the number three is complete. I'm not complete unless I see my glory in you. Last one, verse 30. And to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. So the meat was in the grass, but the grass was resurrected from the land. We're just talking about multiples of three, biblical meaning of the number three. Does that make sense to you? 
every time I read the text, multiples of three, what I glean is divine wholeness, fullness, resurrection, completeness, and perfection. Any text, any scripture in the text, there are 31,102 verses. Any one of them in a multiple of three, I can pull that meaning out. Thank you so much. Let's, let's try it with Psalm 1. There's only, there's not that many. Y'all give them a hand. Give Elder Willis a hand. Come on. They had no idea what I was going to do. I just needed volunteers tonight. I want to flow by the, by the Spirit of God. And the Bible says, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Read that one more time, Brother Isaiah. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water uh -huh. that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. It is that bringing forth again of a resurrection because you're now in Psalm 1 and 3. Are we, are y'all, does that make sense? Does that make sense? You flow with me? Type in comments in the chat. Let me know. Let's go to the next multiple. Verse number 6. And it says, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. For God to know means that everything he created, he knew it was already in him. So all your actions are doing is resurrecting what has already been known by the mind of God. Does that make sense? Last one. Let's try it with Revelation chapter number one. Brother Marshall, can you guys give Brother Isaiah a hand? Because here's the key here. We're starting in Genesis. We looked at Psalm. Now we're going for Revelation. Or you think I'm just randomly picking uh, particular scriptures to prove a point, but this is just to give you a reflection so that you might better glean and understand your Bible. Revelation chapter 1, please. Verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Every time you read the book of Revelation, you get a blessing for just reading it. Because in the, reason, in the reading is a revelation and a resurrection of blessings. And have made us kings and priests unto God, and his Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So verse 6 says he's already made us kings and priests unto God. So you have already been made that. So therefore, this represents your divine wholeness, your fullness. Why are you picking at you? There is nothing wrong with you. I sense that in this place. You're, you're, oh, God, I'm going to get into it in just a moment. When God made you, he made what he wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Next multiple, number nine. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle, isle that, that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The apostle John said the only reason I was on the isle of Patmos in prison is because of the word of God that was in me. If it was in him, that means God wanted to bring it out so it could give it to us. That's why we have the book of Revelation. Is that not a, revel a resurrection of what was in him? We good so far? Next couple, we'll be, and we'll be done. Verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. So the apostle John turns and what was resurrected was seven candlesticks representing the seven churches. The seven churches, uh, I, I don't have time to get into them with Ephesians and uh, Pergamos and Thyatira and Laodicea and Philadelphia. Those churches came from what was in the mind of God. Those churches came from Christ Jesus being in the angels of those churches or the pastors of those churches. So now he turns and sees what's resurrected. He's, and what, what God is saying here is, I got seven churches that have been resurrected standing for truth. Oh, God. <laughs> have you ever been down for the count? And you think that there's no hope, but then God resurrects something that represents truth. This is what the churches did. I'm just 
trying to show you what helped me as I'm reading the text. Last couple, and we've got verse 15. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Oh, God. Oh, God. His voice as the sound of many waters. First of all, we talked about Genesis where he created the water and allowed the water to come together, but we didn't realize that there was a voice in the water because the voice of God sounded like many waters. So there was a resurrection of what was in the water to sound like the power and the voice of God. Are, are we, is this making sense to you? Last one, verse 18, there's another multiple here. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. I was alive. Well, I was dead. Now I'm alive. Is that not resurrection? This is Jesus. Thank you. Can you give it up for Brother Marshall? Now would you stand to your feet? Acts chapter number 9. Y'all say, what is he doing tonight? Acts chapter number 9, we're going to read this from the message translation. While you are standing, let me give you some other context of the number 3. In Exodus chapter number 10, verses 21 through 22, Moses stretched forth his hand. This is the plague's the 10 plagues, one of the plagues was darkness, and there was a plague for three days. Genesis chapter 22, verse number four, Abraham slay thy son, thine only son. He goes up to Mount Moriah, but he sees it on the third day. He's talking about the number three. Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter number three, Samuel is being called by God three times before he goes to Eli. Is that now not a fullness and completion, what God was wanting to perfect in Samuel, different than Eli? Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days. Somebody type three days in the chat. Jesus was tempted in the desert for how many, how many times? Three. According to biblical history, we believe that the ministry of Jesus lasted for how many years? Three years. And Jesus was resurrected on the... Oh, third day. Y'all been reading y'all's Bible. Acts chapter number 9, verses 1 through 22. A lot, of, a lot of scripture here. Our team has the message translation. If you guys could put that up, the message translation. I want you to hear it in a robust translation where we can really get the fullness of what it is actually saying. Now, once we read these uh, there's a reason that I'm doing this. We're going to park in just a moment, and then we're going to flow. Somebody say amen. amen. Word, up. Word up. Man, I almost backslid. I thought about Cameo. What's the word or word up? Maybe Cameo was right. Word, word. This the word. This the word. This the word. Okay. Acts chapter number 9, verse number 1. We're going to read the message translation. All this time, Saul was breathing down the necks of the master's disciples out for the kill. He went to the chief priests and got arrest warrants to take, the meeting, to take to the meeting places in Damascus so that he found anyone there belonging to the way, whether men or women, he could arrest them and bring them to Jerusalem. So you're just going to take them to jail for believing. He set off when he got to the outskirts of Damascus, when he got close. Mm. It's one thing for the devil to mess with you, but it's another thing for when the devil is getting ready to try to destroy you. When he gets close to you, then God has to do something. Am I the only one that God has ever stepped in on your behalf when the devil got close? He was suddenly dazed by a blinding flash of light. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you out to get me? The King James says, why are you kicking against the pricks? The pricks were prongs in the back of a stable whereby the ox 
would be mad because it was contained in this cage, so it would kick against the pricks, but there were sharp pricks at the back of the cage to keep the oxen from kicking, and every time it kicked, it would feel something sharp. It would teach the ox to stop kicking against something that was going to hurt it or bruise it. He said, who are you, master? I am Jesus, the one you're hunting down. I want you to get up and enter the city. In the city, you'll be told what to do next. Next verse. His companion stood there dumbstruck. They could hear the sound but couldn't see anyone while Saul, picking himself up off the ground, found himself stone blind. That's blind. They had to take him by the hand and lead him into Damascus. He continued blind for how many days? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's been something to this three all the time. Saul was blind for three days. He ate nothing, drank nothing. Wait a minute. You blind for three days. You can't see. You don't have food and you don't have water for three days. God forced him on a three-day fast to change his life. There was a disciple in Damascus by the name of Ananias. The master spoke to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, master, he answered. Get up and go over to Straight Avenue. The King James says Straight Street. Oh, God. You know you done messed up when God takes your eyesight and sends you to Straight Street. You wouldn't fly straight on your own, so God had to send you to Straight Street. I know you look good right now. You shout and dance at church, but some of y'all got saved and had to go to Straight Street. Ask at the house of Judas for a man named, a man from Tarsus. His name is Saul. He's there praying. He has just had a dream in which he saw a man named Ananias enter the house and lay hands on him so he could see again. So you mean to tell me that old backslidden Saul was blind without food or drink, but then he has a vision? Don't tell me God won't speak to people who you don't think don't know him. We're almost there. Ananias protested, Master, you can't be serious. Everybody's talking about this man and the terrible things he's been doing, his reign of terror against your people in Jerusalem. And now he's shown up here with papers from the chief priest. Wait a time out. The papers are from the pastor? The, the papers are from the chief priests? The papers came from somebody who you should have trusted. Oh, God, that give him license to do the same to us. The chief priests gave him these affidavits, these warrants, <laughs> Lord have mercy, to take them to jail. Next section. But the master said, don't argue. Go. Wait a minute. Time out. Time out. Ananias was scared. <laughs> And I said, God, I know that I'm supposed to lay hands on him, but what has happened is what had happened was I heard that he was a Christian killer. And some of you are afraid of people that don't know God because you don't have power yourself. But the master said, don't agree. Go. I have picked him as my personal representative to non-Jews and kings and Jews, and now I'm about to show him what he's in for the hard suffering that goes with this job. Oh, God. Do the, pre do the preachers understand what I'm saying? They want a badge and a collar and a church, but they don't understand that there's hard suffering? Good God Almighty. Endure hardness as a good soldier? So, Anna, now, I, I, can, can we, this is Bible study, and I think it's time that we immerse ourselves in truth. This is a couple of last sections. So, Ananias went and found the house. He went to Straight Street, where Judas lived, and found old Saul of Tarsus. Placed his hands on blind Saul and said, wait a minute, time out. Ananias didn't want to go at first. 
he was kind of like Jonah. But once he went, that didn't, that didn't mean that he didn't still have power in his hand. And said, Brother Saul, the master sent me the same Jesus you saw on your way here. Wait a minute. How did he know that he saw Jesus? The light was G. Oh, God, let me, let me hold that back. I'm going to get ahead of myself. The same Jesus you saw on your way here, he sent me so you could see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. No sooner were the words out of his mouth. Good God. The words, good God. The words couldn't even get out of his mouth and Saul was being delivered. Then something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. Oh, God. I was lost, but now I am found. He got to his feet. <laughs> Saul was still on the ground. Ananias had so much glory in his hand because he was doing what God had called him to do that Saul was on the ground, but now he stands up. Scales fall from his eyes. He was baptized and sat down with them to a hearty meal. Last few verses and we almost done. Saul spent a few days getting acquainted with the Damascus disciples. He, went a few, he, <laughs> he spent a few days getting acquainted with the people that he was going to kill. It's almost time to sit. But then went right to work, wasting no time preaching in the meeting places that this Jesus was the Son of God. I thought you didn't believe in that. I thought you thought Jesus was only a prophet, Saul. Mm. They were cut off. Ah, they, they were cut off, guard by this, and not all sure they could trust him. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know that there's something wrong, that you don't live a tough life when you get delivered and the church folk don't trust your deliverance. They kept saying, isn't this the man who wreaked havoc in Jerusalem among the believers? And didn't he come here to do the same, arrest us and drag us off to jail in Jerusalem by sentencing, for the sentencing by the high priest? They said, Lord, we, isn't this the same one? The priest gave jurisdiction to take us to jail? Last verse and we done. But their, suspicious, their suspicions didn't slow Saul down for even a minute. He didn't care. Some of you have come out of backgrounds where there's been drug, sex addiction, illness. You've come out of backgrounds where you come from gangs, mafia. You come out of backgrounds where you were so shrewd. You come out of backgrounds where you were lascivious. You come out of backgrounds where you were pride. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what the people uh, say about you in church. You still got to do what God has called you to do. You got to pay it. No, never mind. So what? They don't think you saved. So what? They don't think you changed. Oh, oh, oh. But their suspicions didn't slow Saul down for a minute. His momentum was up now. And he plowed straight into the opposition, disarming the Damascus Jews and tried to show them that this Jesus was the Messiah. Mm, mm, mm. Before we pray, I want to use for a subject, unstoppable. Look at your neighbor and say, unstoppable. Come on, look at the other neighbor and say, I'm unstoppable. Father, I ask that you would hide me behind this sacred desk. Do what only you can do. Throw your weight around. Let the devil know who is boss in this place. Give us divine revelation and truth and power in the articulation of your word. In the invincible name of Jesus, amen. You might be seated. The word stop or the definition means to hinder, to close up, or to block to restrain, to prevent, prevent, suppress, or discontinue. It means to cease, to halt, to end, to quit, to discontinue, to delay, to drop, or to conclude. Somebody shout, stop! Well, I probably can show you better than I can tell you. Uh, team, work with me. Can you show them a quick video so that this will convince them of my title? If God is all powerful and his plan is impossible to prevent, then what does that say about you? His plan A, you are unstoppable. 
Nothing or nobody can defeat you. That's right, you are powerful beyond measure. No one has your DNA, fingerprint, or footprint. When God created you, he broke the mold. You are a bad somebody. And as long as you have breath in your body, God has given you a chance to pursue your purpose, discover your destiny, and leave a legacy to the next generation. So if you are stopped, it's because you have failed to believe in God and yourself. What is a stop sign to a cheetah? What is a red light to a whale? What is a roadblock to an eagle? What is the word no to a child of God? I repeat, you are unstoppable. And there is nothing you can do about it. Why? Because you are a child of God. I was convicted because before that video, I said, God, AI can do anything. <laughs> as long as you have breath in your body, God has given you a chance to pursue your purpose, discover your destiny, and to walk in your legacy. That's why I'm trying to articulate, what's the stop sign to a cheetah? What's a red light to a whale? What's a roadblock to an eagle? It is above it. What is a no to a child to God? I repeat, you are unstoppable. Somebody say unstoppable. There arose a few years ago during the pandemic what was called PPE. This PPE, you know, it was your protection, uh, your personal protection equipment, your personal protective equipment that gave you a pass for COVID, so we thought. We didn't want, the, we didn't want COVID to get into our lungs, therefore affecting us. But no matter what you put on yourself, sometimes things seem to get in. But I watched Bad Boys uh, the other day. I don't know, Bad Boys 20, whichever Bad Boys it was. Uh, do you remember when uh, Martin Lawrence told Will Smith, or in other words, Marcus Barnett told Mike Lowry that everything was going to be all right? He said, I can't die. You, did you see that as well? Nothing can stop you. Your beauty in motion. You're handsome. You're gifted. You're anointed. You're unique. When God made you, he broke the mold. You're chosen. Listen, you lost relationships, but then God sent more relationships. What I'm trying to tell you that you tried to fit in, but the problem is you'll never be able to fit in because you're too large to fit in spaces. Who can't handle you? What am I trying to say? I'm trying to tell you that you're a survivor. No curse can break you. No words can destroy you. You are a bad somebody. The car wreck didn't take you out. The husband who left you, oh God, didn't, didn't even change your mind about who you are because you're still a bad woman. The woman who left you, God is still blessing you, man. You are a survivor. Why? You're unstoppable, baby. But you're not just unstoppable because it comes from your flesh. You're unstoppable because Jesus was unstoppable. Nothing could stop Jesus. It's going to get real bad right here because Jesus, they thought they could stop him. And every time they would come in to take him and it wasn't his time, he would slip another way. They sent a leper. I, I believe that this was a leper sent because nobody else has ever been uh, around leprosy and didn't receive leprosy. And Jesus heals a leper, a leper in Mark chapter number one. He heals the leper. He said, don't tell nobody. But you know the leper had to tell somebody. And then the leper had, he said, go show yourself to the priest. But the one leper comes back and says, wait a minute. I'm not like the other nine because I know you the true high priest. <laughs> Jesus was so unstoppable that they, they tried to uh, take him and, and box him in a house so that nobody else could get healed. But then they, he, four friends dug through the roof and dropped a man down who was paralytic and he still got healed. Jesus was unstoppable. Jesus was so unstoppable that we get to Mark chapter number three. They told him not to heal on the Sabbath, but he says, he looked at the man with the withered arm. He said, stretch forth. And Jesus is still telling you to stretch forth no matter what people think about you, no matter what they said about you, no matter what your job did. It doesn't matter. Your clients left you. Your job fired you. But God is still with you. You're unstoppable, baby. Jesus is so unstoppable that uh, Mark chapter number four, we see that he says, I don't even need the massive seed. All I need is a must seed. And he said, in fact, if you believe on me, he says, what I'm trying to tell you is if you, have, if, if you just have the, the, uh, the faith of a size of a mustard seed, you can do anything. Jesus is unstoppable. This is why the woman with the issue of blood in Mark, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm pregnant with this text right now. Mark chapter number five, what happens is the woman with the issue of blood, she says, if I could just but touch the hem of his 
his garment. The reason why she wanted to touch the hem, because everybody's grappling at the top, and you think the glory is at the top, but the real glory is at the bottom. It's at the bottom of your experience. It's for the people who crawl for it. It's for the people who walk for it. It's for the people who strain for it. It's for the people who are hungry for the word of God. Do I have any God chasers in the building? Mark chapter number six, Jesus is so unstoppable that he begins to walk on top of water. He's walking on top of things that pulled other people down. I don't know who you are, but God's about to bless you to walk on top of something that everybody else drowned in. God's about to bless you to walk on top of something that made somebody else blow their brains out. God's about to bless you to make it through a situation where the devil didn't think, th the devil thought you didn't have no hope. He thought it was down, you were down for the count. But God said you're unstoppable because Jesus was unstoppable. I'm just pregnant with this text. Mark chapter number seven, we begin to see that this is Sarah, Phoenician woman. She has a daughter. Her daughter needs to be healed. And she says, listen, I need my daughter to be healed. But Jesus said, yo, it was, it was a tough statement. He said, it's not me for me to give the, the dogs to the, you know, the, the, the children's crumbs to the dogs. She said, but even the dogs can eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Jesus is so unstoppable. He said, I'll just give you a little crumb and you're going to be healed. Jesus was amazing. Jesus was powerful. Not only was it Sarah, Phoenician woman, then we see Jesus. He says, listen. I need you to go feed these 5,000. They've been sitting, they've been waiting for a while. The disciples are like, we don't have any food. He said, go get the little boy's happy meal. Go get two fish and five loaves of bread. Jesus was He said, nothing will stop this mission. Go feed them. I take two fish and loaves and I'll make it multiply. Some of you are on a multiply situation right now. Some of you just got two fish in your bank account right now. Some of you just have a loaf of bread in your refrigerator right now. But God's about to spin it around and make it good. Mark chapter number nine. Let me just make sure I'm holding my place. Well, Mark chapter number nine, we're just walking up to the text. It's Mark chapter number nine. I think we see that there's a man with a deaf and a dumb spirit. Jesus said, come here, let me take care of that. The disciples said, wait a minute, why couldn't we cast this out? Jesus said, some things don't come out but by fasting and prayer. In other words, some of you want real breakthroughs, but you don't want to fast. Some of you want real breakthroughs, but you don't want to pray. Some of you want to be at the top. You want to be a millionaire, but you're not really ready to do the work because God says some things only come out by fasting and prayer. And I know you think it's only nasty spirits, but sometimes broke spirits come out by fasting and prayer. Sometimes lack of entrepreneurship comes out by fasting and prayer. Sometimes the lack of real estate comes out by fasting and prayer. Sometimes the lack of investing and making millions and millions hand over fist comes out by fasting and prayer. Mark chapter number 10, we saw that Jesus now is going to heal blind Bartimaeus. Oh God. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. Blind Bartimaeus is crying, calling for Jesus. And some of you think that other people are too loud in church. All the quiet people, all the quiet people be quiet. But all the people who really want a breakthrough, I need you to make some noise in this place. Now, now, that would be good if you weren't really facing what you really think you, what, what you're really hiding right now. But I know some of you are facing impossible situations. I need to hear the real saint shout. <laughs> Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. Oh, God. That's my problem. I'm not a preacher. I'm an experience. Because when I've experienced the word of God, how could I just get up and use one text? Have mercy upon me. Have you ever had God? Oh, have you ever needed mercy? Anybody needed mercy? Am I the only one that's ever needed the mercy of God? Blind by the man says, have mercy upon me. Jesus says, okay, I will. And he sees. And the next chapter after blind by the man, we begin to see, I believe it's chapter number 11. Jesus says, I need the reason why I'm stoppable is because everybody else let some things stop them because they didn't have the proper transportation. He says, go get a coat, or the King James says, go get an ass that is tied that nobody else has ridden. He says, I'll take something that nobody ever used and make it work. Jesus said, go get, the, go get the coat that's been tied up. Nobody has ever even sat on it. In other words, this is a coat that hadn't been tamed before. This is a horse that hadn't been tamed. This horse needs to be broken. in. And some of you are afraid to break in ideas. You're afraid to break in concepts. You're afraid to break in what, what you've never discovered before. But this is a season for you to do the unthinkable. This is a season for you to emerge. This is a season for you to walk on top of water. This is a season to do something that you've never done before, but you got to saddle the thing that was trying to be held up. He rides on this coat. Hosanna, Hosanna. I'm just talking about the text. I'm talking because sometimes we come to Bible study and we preach and teach. I, I'm, we, we're gonna preach and we teach and we'll say hallelujah. But I want to go through the text because sometimes it is a text in context that gives me power when I leave this place. 
Jesus is unstoppable because in Mark chapter number 12, he sees a fig tree with leaves on it, but it has no fruit. You, if you're going to be unstoppable, you have to recognize deception when it's in your way. The reason why Jesus cursed the fig tree is because it was deceptive. What are you doing having leaves looking like you're prosperous and fruitful, but you're bearing no fruit? He cursed, oh God, let me put that on your level. Some things around you, you're going to have to curse with your mouth. You say, I'm not, I didn't say curse people. I'm talking about situations. Because sometimes you have to say, wait a minute, I'm not performing in this area. Something's wrong. You got to speak to it and make it work. I wish I had some people who would jump on their feet and speak to the situation. I speak to my house. I speak to my faith. I speak to my family. I speak to my money. I speak to my children. I speak to low self-esteem. I speak to depression. I speak to anxiety. Speak to it. Oh, 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 you haven't been praying in your house. I have no choice. I got the prayer warrior herself, Elder Christy Dobbs. Listen, 6 a.m. prayer, midnight prayer. It's just always praying, praying, praying. But sometimes we need people who will pray and cast the devil out. You trying to cast the devil out in church, but you got to cast him out in your home. Speak to it. Jesus spoke to the fig tree. And the next chapter, chapter 13, they walk back by and the fig tree withered up. Jesus is unstoppable because that that he spoke came to light. He said, these words, I speak a spirit of life, and it came to pass. Jesus was about to go to the cross. They thought they had him. They thought they were going to stop him. But here's what happens. He says, wait a minute. Before I go to the cross, let me stop by Mark chapter number 14 because the woman has to take what you think is wasting money and anoint me. Oh, God. <laughs> Nothing could stop Jesus because there were people who would anoint him. Oh, God. You would have been stopped, but somebody was praying for you. So your grandmother kept anointing your head. Your, 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 your father kept praying on you. Oh, God, your mother, she, she, kept, she kept pouring that oil. And every now and then, God will send somebody to anoint you to prepare you for battle. Oh, oh, you don't understand the anointing. The anointing is like an olive that is crushed. In other words, when the olive is crushed and it's reached oil, this is where the oil comes over the top. Okay, let me, let, me, let, me give, let, me, let me give another illustration. What would happen is the sheep would stick their head into places that they shouldn't go. But because of the anointing, because of the oil, it would slip back out. Oh, God. The sheep would often stick his head into places that wasn't supposed to go. And the snakes would try, to, would try to bite them with veins, but the snakes would bite, but it would get caught on the wool and slip back out. The only reason you slip back out of something is because the oil is on your life. The only reason that relationship didn't catch you up is because you slipped back out. The only reason that, 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 that you're not bound right now is because somebody prayed for you. Somebody anointed your head, and you slip it back out. I wear the slip back out, people. You're too slippery to be caught by the devil. You're too slippery to be stuck. You're too slippery to be bound up. You're too slippery to be broke. You're too slippery. That's why they talked about you and it didn't work because you kept slipping out of the room. A slip, 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 slip. And Jesus said, Mark chapter number 15, I just picked Mark 15. I picked the book of Mark because it's only 16 chapters and it's easy to memorize. When you get to Mark chapter number 15, they're crucifying our Savior. What amazes me is that they're crucifying him. They hung him high. They stressed him wide. The historian Josephus, we got just a little bit of time. Pastor Don, pray for me. I got 800 scriptures and then five hoops in me. The historian Josephus says they put a crown of thorns on his head. It says basically these are about 360 thorns braided together, and they put it on his skull. The scholars say he suffered a uh, a hypovolemic shock, a type of asthma, asphyxia. In other words, there's blood running down his temples. And then they pierce him in between the metal tarsal spaces of his foot. They pierce him in between the radius and the corpus bone. Now, you do know that he was, his bones weren't broken because the prophecy said if this is going to be a lamb, this has got to be a spotless lamb without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. If this is going to be the true Messiah. Then in other words, this follows the text all the way through because what happened here is that they crucified him. They pierced him in the side. Blood and water comes out. He says, Eli, Eli, lava sabbatini. My God, my God. I thirst. I thirst for people to understand what this is doing. This is not even for me. This is for them. This is for the, that they might believe. If I be lifted up, I will draw. Without the shedding of blood, there will be no. <gasps> and he hung his head into the locks of his shoulders. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
because he had to be forsaken by the father because if the father was still with him, he could never die. The anointing was so powerful that if the father didn't back up and allow the son to have some glory that accident him, he would have never died. If he didn't remove the spirit, then the flesh would have forever lived because the spirit was in the flesh. And he's in the ground. First day, second day, but on that third day, he got up with all power in his hand. Jesus was unstoppable. You're unstoppable. Jesus is unstoppable. So why was Paul stopped? Or why was Saul stopped on the Damascus Road? When we approach this text, Saul is a Christian killer. Y'all going to make, okay, you, you're going to really make me teach, teach. We, we, we got a little time. Because you do know that Acts chapter number one, after the crucifixion, Jesus got it with all power to sin. He showed himself alive for 40 days with many infallible proofs. Everybody good with that? Somebody type in the chat, 40 days. He's alive 40 days. Another text says over 500 people saw him. Ah, ah, I've been reading. Ah, ah. My old professor, Dr. Sally, he'd be like, ah, ah, I want you to pay attention to this. I can hear him now in my spirit. Over 500 people saw him. He was alive 40 days, and he tells them to go to Jerusalem and pray until you receive power. He says, but when you receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power, and you shall be witnesses where? In Jerusalem, Judea, and Sub Jerusalem. Jerusalem. You shall be witnesses in Jerusalem. Jesus told them to be witnesses in Jerusalem, but this gospel has spread to Damascus beyond Jerusalem. Oh, Damascus, my good friends, is where Saul is about to be demasked of everything he thought he knew. Sometimes that that you think you know about God, you can throw it in the trash. He was zealous according to the law. He understood the God of the Old Testament, but he didn't know how to transition to the new. Forty days, Jesus shows himself alive. He ascends up on a cloud to glory. They see him. They say, why are you standing here gazing? The same God shall come in like manner. One day he's going to part the sky. I don't, know about, I don't know about you, but I'm waiting for him to come back. So they go and they pray in the upper room for ten days. Praying and fasting. How many days was Jesus alive? Forty days. Plus the ten days of fasting equals 50 days. This is where we get Pentecost. Pentagon, five. You with me so far? So 40 plus 10 equals 50. So on the day of Pentecost, oh God, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there were one accord in one place, and there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Once they got filled, those 120 in the upper room, then they begin to go and witness. Peter starts preaching. He said, he said, this same Jesus you crucified. Oh, God, you crucified the Lord of glory. Peter was a, man, Peter was a trip. You, you denied him, but then you, you denied him, cussed, act like you didn't know him. They say, Peter, hey, Peter, hey, Peter you, you were with him. They said, mm. he said, I don't want to be crucified like that. So he preaches on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 souls get saved. We're just walking over from Acts chapter 1. Chapter 2, they're filled with the Holy Ghost. Chapter 1, Jesus ascends. Chapter 2, they're filled with the Holy Ghost. Chapter 3, Peter preaches. 3,000 get sold. Chapter 4, now we're seeing that they take Peter and John. They, they're taking these disciples to jail because they're preaching in the name of Jesus. <laughs> you know it's something when they start trying to take you to jail for saying Jesus. You can say God and everything else. You can say I fuck. You can say you can say everything else. But the moment you start putting Jesus, sometimes with comments on social media, am I the only one? Because some people still don't believe that He is the Savior. Oh God, which is why in Acts chapter number five. Listen, they sold all their possessions. They're going to build the church. They start building a vibrant church. They build a church so vibrant that in Acts chapter number six, I'm just walking through the text. We okay? 
Acts chapter number 6, we see that they're saying, listen, we need to divide this work up. The preachers are going to preach, but we need deacons to help serve and create. Can we give it up for our deacons who have been serving excellent in this house? Now, what we need to do is create deacons. And one of the deacons, other than Philip and Orcanus and many others, was a man named Stephen. The deacons are created in Acts chapter number 6, Acts chapter number 7. Then we see that Stephen is stoned for preaching the truth. Some people will kill you and think they did God a favor. I know you're against abortions, and I know you're against so many different things, but does that mean you have to bomb the clinic? I know you're against so many different sins, but does that mean you have to play God and kill the person yourself? So Acts chapter number 7, Stephen is stoned, and he looks up and does what Jesus does. He says, Father, don't lay this charge to their, don't, don't lay this charge to, in other words, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Acts chapter number 8, Philip. Oh, preaching, Philip. Spirit carries him away to Azadis. Don't have time to fully deal with that. Samaria and, and the gospel is just spreading. And the text says that Philip preached unto them Jesus. This preaching had got so bad that Saul says, I'm the person who they brought the clothes to of dead Stephen and laid him at my feet. Yeah. It was Saul who would stand right here and say, go get him. A mobster of mobsters. And they would lay bloody clothes at his feet and say, yes, Saul, we've gotten the job done. It is this Saul that is now on his road, on his way to Damascus, on the Damascus road, because he's just left Jerusalem where the high priest was and received warrants so that he could go take them so that the people in Damascus could now go to jail. Damascus was a perfect city because it was a crossroads between Africa and Asia. Is this too much information? I just want to give you your text. Damascus is right in the middle. You've got to the West Africa, to the East Asia. So it is a commercial center. It is a commerce. And at the time, that was a large city. It was a mile or so long and a mile or so wide. And in the middle of Damascus was Straight Street. So he's on his way to Damascus, riding, oh God, some scholars say that he was on his way to Damascus riding a beast or a horse that he couldn't tame. But I won't just leave it to human research. So he's on his way to kill them so that he can take them. He's got a warrant for their arrest. Sometimes you can be on your way to do something that you think is good or you could be sincere, but you're sincerely wrong. Saul actually thought he was doing God a favor. He's on his way on this Damascus road. And all of a sudden, a bright light shine. A bright light shine. The King James said it shined around him. Because if the bright light would have shined on him, I think it would have killed him which makes me know that we got to pay attention to what this light was. What kind of light was this? Was this the light of Israel? Was this the light that told Abraham to slay thy son, thy only son? Was this the light that told Isaac to rebuild the wells of his father? Was this the light that turned Jacob into Israel? Was this the light that took Joseph from the pit to the palace to from the pit to the prison to the palace? Is this the light that was burning in the burning bush and was not consumed? Is this the light that told Joshua, only be thou strong and courageous and you will possess the land? Is this the light that was Rahab's kinsman redeemer, or excuse me, of Rahab's red cord? Is this the light that was Ruth's kinsman redeemer? I wonder what kind of light this was. Is this the light that told Samson, I'm not only strengthening your hair, but I'm allowing my spirit to come upon you? What kind of light was this? Was this the light that David used to sing praise and worship songs about? Was this the light that gave uh, Solomon wisdom? Was this the light that told in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a time and a season for everything? Was this the light that Isaiah saw high and lifted up? And 
and his train filled the temple. Was this the light that was caught up on the inside of Jeremiah because it was like fire set up in his bone? I wonder what kind of light this was. Was this the light that delivered Daniel in the, in the midst of light? Was this the light that delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because this light was sitting with him? What kind of light was, was this the light that Malachi said, behold, the messenger is coming? What kind of light was this? Is this the light that created you? Is this the light that stepped out on nothing and created something? Is this the light that said, let there be? Is this the light that separated the firmness? Is this the light that said, let the dry land appear? Is this the light that created the sun, the moon, and star? Is this the light that created plants and animals? Is this the light that blew the breath of life into man? I wonder what kind of light this was. This light represented the glory and the power of God. And anytime God shines his light on you, it's not to kill you, but it's to correct you. I know nobody talks about rebuke and correction, but I'm going to tap it for just a moment because every now and then, God will shine his light to show you where you're wrong. I wonder what kind of light this was. Is this the light, oh God, that is that, that's Jehovah Jireh, my provider? Is this the light that's Jehovah Shama, the Lord that's God that's there? Is this the light that's Jehovah Nisi, which is my banner against him? Is this the light that's the shepherd? Is this the light that's the light of the world? I wonder what kind of light this is. This light was so powerful that it was able to knock Saul off his beast, have a personal conversation with Saul. His friends heard something, but they didn't see anything. Sometimes God will do deep work with you and talk to you, but nobody else really know what he said. God will correct you in the dark. <laughs> Am I the only one? I wonder what kind of light this is. I'm all off schedule. I wonder what kind of light this is. This light blinded Saul. And he's blind three days without sight, food, and water. He's blind. He's blind. What happened in these three days? Because I opened up talking about the number three. If the number three represents a resurrection, then Saul is about to be resurrected into a new person. If the number three represents the perfection and the wholeness and the divine perfection, this means that Saul in three days is about to be changed to something that you've never seen before. See, some of you think you're stuck, you think you're bound, you think you're depressed, you think you don't feel good, you think you're isolated, but isolation brings revelation. The only reason God has you in the dark is because he's about to bring you to the light. I wonder what happened in these three days. I wonder what happened because he gets a vision while he has to go to, I got to, I got to, yes, Lord, thank you. He gets a vision while he's having to go to Judas's house. Now, Judas, don't confuse Judas and Judah because technically they mean the same thing. Judah is more Hebrew. Judas is Greek. They mean the same thing. They mean praise. Oh, you just missed it. I gave you a good place to shout. Saul has to go to, to Judas's house. Saul has to go to the house of praise in order to be delivered. It's something about praise. Do I have any praises in the building? It's something about praise that'll raise you out of the situation. It's something about praise that'll deliver you out of what you thought you were stuck in. Saul has to go to praise's house. On straight street. The only reason that I'm able to walk straight and holy is because of my praise. Let everything that hath praise you. Would you jump on your feet and praise him for a moment? Is there anything you can thank him for? Do you have gratitude? I thank him for simple stuff like my teeth, my tongue, my heart, my liver, my tissues. I thank him for being able to use the bathroom. I thank him for my pancreas. I thank him for my feet, my mind. I thank him for my hands. I thank him for simple things like water. I thank him for simple things like being able to breathe and inhale and exhale. Wait a minute, inhale? You owe him a praise because you were able to inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. Do I have any praises in the building? Oh, God, we almost said y'all about to start a ruckus in this place. See, it's the grateful people that start praising God when ain't nothing wrong. It's the grateful people that start praising God because you know if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, you would have been swallowed up. I praise him because I, oh, God, 
I praise it because I didn't catch the disease when I deserved it. I praise it because I didn't get fired when I deserved it. I praise it because he still kept me. I praise it because I'm not in prison, but I could have been. I praise him. Do I have anybody who will praise God? Or are you just going to act like you got there by yourself? You're unstoppable because of your praise. Oh, God. I can't stop praising him. That's the, only, that's the thing that makes me unstoppable because it's my praise. I got enough things to thank him for that the devil could never stop me if I keep opening my mouth. The de oh, God, that's your problem. You think you're going to die, but that's because you closed your mouth. I dare you to open your mouth and praise him. Who I praise him for my toes. I praise him for my finger. I praise him for my kids. I praise him for my wife. I, somebody ought to praise him for singles. I praise him for my job. I praise him for food. I praise him for thinking. I praise him. Praise is the thing that helps you raise out of your sin. David says, I will extol the old Lord. Oh, God. I don't want to get caught in the book of Psalms. But I'm going to tell you something. When David said in Psalm 68, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Oh, God. What would happen if you let praise arise? Because, oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. What would happen if you let praise arise? You do know that the praise is God rising in you. Oh, that's a resurrection. You do know that the praise is rising on the inside. Let God arise and his enemy be scattered. Let all them that flee, that hate him flee. Psalm 70 says, make haste, make haste, make haste. Okay, we almost said, I got to teach just a little bit and we done, we done, we done, we done. Saul is on the road to Damascus. A bright light shined around him. <laughs> He's knocked off his beast. He's on the ground. They got to pick him up and carry him to where he needs to go. And it's interesting enough that he goes to the house of Judas, which is the Greek name for praise, which is basically like going to Judah. It's too late to insert the insert this. This is probably bad preaching if I were preaching because you typically give this information up front. But I was studying today and the Lord started talking to me about Damascus. It was prophesied in Isaiah 17 that there was going to be destruction in Damascus. Hmm. There was a split between the northern and southern kingdom and I know, please forgive me for bringing all this information in late. The, but my scholars know that there's a southern and a northern kingdom. The preachers know. The 12 tribes of Israel were broken up. There were 10 on the north, 2 on the south. The 2 on the south were Judah and Benjamin, the southern kingdom. Ephraim was leading the northern kingdom to go destroy Damascus. This is Isaiah 17. You also can tag team with Isaiah 8. To 8. I'm, I'm loaded. Lord, forgive me, watch the tape, uh, re review the, the link again. And I said, God, why is that important? He says, Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. So this is the tribe of Benjamin hooking up with their brothers, the tribe of Judah. Mm -hmm. So he goes, so Benjamin goes to Judah. And every now and then, when you're going through something, you got to connect with your family. Every now and then when you're going through something, he's blind. He hadn't eaten without food, drink, water. He goes to the house of Judas. The name Saul, by the way, means prayed for. <laughs> All the while he was wrong, being a Christian killer, somebody was praying for him. Would to God that we would just be thankful and praise God for the people who've prayed for us. I wouldn't be here without my mother. I wouldn't be here without my grandmother. I wouldn't be here without my wife, my sister. I wouldn't be here if Bishop and many of us hadn't prayed for me. The only reason you're standing where you're standing or sitting where you're sitting is because somebody prayed for you. And Saul was blind. And Ananias said, yo, God, I don't know. Saul has a vision of somebody laying hands on him. 
He has a vision. You do know that you can be in the spirit and have visions and see things that haven't happened yet. You call it deja vu, but it's the Holy Ghost showing it to you before it ever even happened. He saw a vision of Ananias laying hands on him, but Ananias didn't want to lay hands on him. Sometimes your blessing is held up by stubborn people. It's not that God doesn't want to bless you. They just haven't obeyed yet. They just haven't opened the door yet. And you keep thinking that there's something, God, what's wrong with me? Am I not teaching good enough? Am I not preaching good enough? Am I not living good enough? Am I not saving my money? What am I doing? Am I not, do I need to take more classes? What am I doing? It's nothing wrong with you. It's something wrong with them. Why are you the first person to point to yourself rather than other people? But you've been taught to devalue you. So you don't understand the true worth that you are. So you, work, you, you value other people and you forget about the fact that you are anointed and everything must come to you in the end that God has for you. Yeah. Ananias is stubborn, but he obeys. He lays hands on him. <laughs> the scales fall. The scales fall. Oh, God. Would to God that we were just thinking for scales falling. You're watching online. Something is falling off you right now. You clicked on for it. Something is falling. I don't know what's falling. Low self-esteem is falling. Depression is falling. Schizophrenia is falling. Illness is falling. Cancer is falling. HIV is falling. Crohn's disease is falling. Fibroids are shrinking. Lumps are going down. Fall, 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 fall. What are the prayer warriors at? Ankle swelling is going down. Lupus is falling. I said, is, I, did you hear me, devil? I said, it's falling. It's falling. i turn this into a prayer meeting in a minute. It's falling. I'll plead the blood. I'll plead the blood over your mind. I'll plead the blood over your family. I'll plead the blood over every elbow. Fall, 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 fall. It's going to fall like rain. I don't know what's been had you bound up, but it's going to fall. Oh, God. Let me stand up here so I can see you better. It's falling. Hear me good. Look me in the eye. It's falling. It's falling. It's falling. And some of you, I heard the Holy Ghost say, it's not your fault. It's falling. It's falling. It's falling. You've been taking everything over here. It's not your fault. It's falling. It's about to fall. 